So it's such a blessing that was. Thank you so much. Young people can be dismissed at this time while they go back to Children's Church. We're grateful to have them taught on their own level there. That's a blessing. And what a great group of kids we have today. That's a good thing, isn't it? Praise the Lord, he's blessed us there. I woke up this morning, and all morning it's still bugging me, but I got a, just a really sore shoulder. And I was sitting in my, uh, you, you might ask, well, you know, were you playing sports yesterday? No, I uh, wasn't cutting wood. I wasn't uh, chopping wood. I didn't go to the gym and work out especially hard. Um, I, I hurt myself sleeping. That's what, that's what age means to me. I mean, this didn't happen when I was in my 20s, where you'd wake up sore and all you did was sleep and you woke up sore. And so, uh, I don't know, I, I'm just starting to get a little bit... Uh, discouraging this getting older is not for wimps, amen? So uh, appreciate that, uh, your prayers as we work through it. And I'm sure it'll be fine by tonight, and then tomorrow I'll have a new pain. But uh, John chapter 15 is where we're at today. John chapter 15. One of the things that we do, by the way, we're also going to be in, uh, I'm going to first read out of Joel chapter 1, J-O-E-L the Old Testament, if you want to turn there, if not, that's fine. I'll, I'll read you some verses here in a few minutes, but our text is going to be in John chapter 15. One of the things we do as human beings is we evaluate our goodness and our badness. We do this automatically, sometimes without thinking. I may not be as good as I should be, but at least I'm not as bad as that or pointing to someone. And so sometimes we gauge our sin by the evil of others trying to make ourselves feel better. Now, this morning here, I have a list of sins, and I want to, it's interesting, in Sunday school, Pastor Forsberg started out with the question, what's the worst sin? And I was thinking, here, we haven't talked one time about what he would do and I would do this morning. We both ended up ranking sins, him in Sunday school and me today. So uh, I want to, before I go into this part, I want to understand our sins, uh, sin is sin, okay? doesn't matter what our sins are. Uh, I don't believe in rating them. In fact, Jesus tried to make it really clear uh, it, it, that, that uh, certain sins we think are not as bad are actually serious. And so uh, we're not in the business here of looking at what sin is less and more. That's not what this is about. It's for a purpose of an illustration, so I want to just set that down. Uh, because as far as sin goes, sin is sin, and the the, whether it's a little white lie or whatever, that's enough to send us to a devil's hell because we are sinners. We are marred. If we break the law in one area, the law is broken as a whole. I understand that. However, as far as consequences go, there are different sins as far as consequences go. Uh, for instance, Jesus said in 1 John 3.15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. But I think you'd agree with me that, thank you, We don't actually get the electric chair or the needle for hating someone like we might for murdering somebody. So, yes, they're both equally bad in the the heart sin, but one of them carries a greater consequence. So this morning, just for the purpose of this illustration, I want to look at these, and we're going to rank these. And I thought one of the worst sins I can think of, I think you'll probably agree with me, is mass murder like Adolf Hitler. I don't think we can get much worse than him. Amen? Uh, killed six million uh, plus Jews and many, many other uh, people as they tried to uh, work against him. So we're going to create a scale here. This will be our 10. This will be our absolute worst sin here. To go with a very light sin, this is, a, this is wrong, but it's not a horrible sin, uh, making fun of pastor's Jeep. Okay, that's... <laughs> not many of you are guilty of this. We have a couple men in our church... One man in particular, I would not give you his name. I don't want to embarrass him. His initials are Wesley Pigors, though. But uh, so we'll, we'll put this. This is not serious at all, okay? Although it's wrong. Don't do it. It's not good. So this is our scale. Making fun of the Jeep and then mass murder Adolf Hitler. Where does stealing end up in there? Stealing. I mean, I think we could... I hate a thief. I, don't, I can't stand... You know, I've heard people say uh, before that they, in fact, I had a business I worked for in Michigan. He said, I I could almost have more sympathy for a murderer than a thief. He just can't stand a thief. But stealing, uh, we can maybe put it around right there in the middle of uh, how bad we think that is. 
Um, how about gossip? How about gossip? That's a pretty ugly sin, isn't it? Gossip, somebody said, is the devil's telephone. The best thing you can do is hang up the phone if somebody starts to do that. And uh, so not only is it, uh, not only is it ugly, it's, it's juvenile too. Great minds talk about ideas. Average minds talk about events. Small minds talk about people. Gossip isn't something we should be a part of, but uh, many people are, even in the church. We're going to put that just right here under stealing there. What about lying? What about lying? Lying's a sin probably most of us do every day. I'm on my way <laughs> when you're not. Uh, I'll be five minutes when you know you'll be 15. Uh, whatever it is, lying. Lying is a sin. We do that a, a lot as well. What about abusing children? I think abusing children is a, is a bad sin, isn't it? I would put that way up above here, uh, maybe right under murder there. And so we do this. We categorize sin. I have another one here I want to talk about today. What about joylessness? Now, you might see that and think, sin, joylessness, a sin? Well, let's look at what the Bible has to say about joylessness. In the book of Joel we see a lot of destruction. Let me just read you a couple of verses and look at the tragedy that's taking place in Israel in the book of Job, chapter Joel. I'm sorry, Joel chapter 1, verse number 4. That which the palmer worm hath left, the locust hath eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. We're talking about bare landscape here. In verse 5, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. In verse 10, he says, The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. In verse 12, he says, The vine is dried up, the fig leaf uh, languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. We're talking about devastation here. Look at the last line. Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Did you catch that last line? And I actually looked up the word because there because sometimes the Bible, uh, Old English can trans switch the for and because and all that. This word is absolutely a word of causation, even in the original language. It does not say that the tragedy came and consequently their joy was gone. It says their joy was gone, and consequently, tragedy came. Joylessness is, was a problem here that is further dealt with in the New Testament. Joylessness, I want to show you today, is a sin. It's seen in the fact that joy is a command of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, you know the verse, Well, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote these words, he had been through the mill. The leaders of the Jews hated his guts. They were trying their best to get him killed. He had been arrested while attending church in Jerusalem. He had almost died in several shipwrecks in transit to Rome because he had appealed to Caesar, even though he was kept in prison for years before he got to stand before Caesar. He's now fighting for his life in a trial, doesn't know what the outcome will be. If he loses his trial to Caesar, that'll be a certain death. And all this time, others are upstaging him. Those that are supposed to be his friends and his uh, co-laborers are upstaging him and spreading false doctrines. Paul really has no reason in his life to rejoice. And yet, the word joy is the central theme in the book of Philippians. How can this be? How can Paul rejoice? <clears throat> if you read Philippians, you'll see Paul is full of joy. He's joyful in his prayers. He rejoices in the fact that the gospel is proclaimed by others. He finds joy in the Philippians and, and a group of people that he's in, never even met. He has joy and he commands us to as well. 
The Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Joylessness is a sin. Now, please don't misunderstand. This is not to say that it is a sin to be sad. The Bible tells us there's a time to weep and a time to mourn. In Philippians 3.18, in this book of joy, Paul talks about how he weeps over people who walk in the flesh. When a loved one dies, of course we will weep. When tragedy comes, uh, weeping is a part of our nature. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is that when we allow circumstances in our life to take our eyes off of Christ and we lose the joy that we should have in Him. In Philippians chapter 4, verse uh, 4 that we read, we're commanded to be rejoicing. The verb is in the present tense, which means that it is a continual thing. We ought to continuously be rejoicing. It's not a one-time act. So we're to be rejoicing, and we're to continue rejoicing. And just in case you miss the tense part, he sticks in that word always. Always, always we need to be rejoicing. There should not be a time when we're not rejoicing in the Lord. If there is, it's usually an indicator of sin. Now, if there's anything in your life that eclipses the Lord, that takes His place as number one in your life, then you lose your joy as that thing gets threatened. Whether it's money, whether it's a relationship, whatever it is, uh, as that gets threatened, you will lose your joy. <clears throat> That's why the Bible says rejoice in the Lord. And in, in that we find the sin when we put our trust in anything other than the Lord. The Bible says re we rejoice in Him. Now, there's two primary reasons why we are to rejoice in the Lord, because of something He has done and because of something that He is doing now. Uh, firstly, we can rejoice in the Lord because Christ died on the cross for our sins. Hallelujah. Just heard a great song about that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission uh, for sins. And we're not talking there about the sacrificing of a lamb, but the sacrificing of the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross for you. We can rejoice in that. We can rejoice that somebody has paid our penalty for the sin that I cannot pay. There is nothing I can do, no, not a, no amount of good works that I can do to outweigh my bad, but somebody loved me enough to go to the cross and die for my sins, and I rejoice over that. Secondly, we can rejoice because the Lord uh, is the Lord of the universe. Everything that happens to us is completely under His loving care and control. These are two bedrock truths that we can plant our joy into. Jesus forgave our sin, and he makes us right before God, and God is completely in control of every circumstance. Now, the past few weeks, we've been looking at the life of Jesus because we've looked, looked, talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and now we're looking at areas in Jesus' life when he exhibited the fruit of the Spirit. We've talked about <coughs> his gentleness, and we've talked about his love, and today, I want to look at another subject in Scripture, as you can imagine, it's joy. The second fruit listed in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, the joy of Jesus. Let's read our chapter here. If you've got your Bibles open, Luke chapter, or John chapter 15, verse number 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is, but, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. As we look today at the joy of Jesus. Father, I pray you'd help us in the next few minutes here as we Seek your word to apply to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For centuries, we've had paintings of Jesus. None of them are portraits. They're just artists' renditions. But there's a commonality that goes through all of them that I've never liked ever since I've been a kid. You always have Jesus looking very solemn, very sad, Never has a smile on his face. In fact, that is, uh, that is considered by many even sacrilegious. And so we, we, we've gotten kind of used to this solemn, sad image we have 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we all know the verse in Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I don't discount that, but that's not all he was. I want to paint today a picture from the Word of God that will show us a different side of our Savior that we might have not, uh, and I'm not trying to uh, conjure up anything. I think we can show from the Word of God what type of person that Jesus was in his day-to-day life. I want to start first with a social observation. This is the weakest of my points. I can just warn you right now. But uh, this, is a, this is just a social observation uh, because we are all attracted, would you not agree, to happy people? Wouldn't you agree? Are we attracted more to happy people or scowling people? That's an obvious one. We're attracted to happy people. I remember uh, very clearly the first time I ever laid eyes on Katie Hall, the girl that would be my wife one day. I remember it was in the, uh, the uh, cafeteria of the school we are going to. It was my second year. It was the first week of the year. And this new girl that had, uh, had uh, just started this semester uh, came in. I hadn't met her yet, but I saw as she was in the middle of a group of people having a great time, everybody was laughing, and she was, uh, getting, she was seemingly the entertainer in that group. And I remember my first impression of my future wife was, that girl is happy, and she likes to make other people happy around her. And that's attractive, isn't it? That's something that attracted me to her. It attracts us. We love that. We love when people are joyful and happy. We are drawn to happy people, even more so women and children. Women and children were drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, They loved him. Now, there's been scores of studies that have been given about how men with a good sense of humor are more attractive than those with physical looks. Aren't you glad for that, Brother Corey? Uh, On top of... (laughs) Just kidding. You were right in my sights, brother. I just had to pick on you. Um, (laughs) On top of the lists of what uh, what appeals to women, you almost always find close to the top, if not the top, a sense of humor. Now, the same goes for children. Children are drawn to people who smile and they are happy. Uh, Grouchy, sad men do not appeal to children. They like to have fun. They like to laugh. In fact, did you know that the average child laughs over 400 times a day? The average adult laughs 15 times. And I can guarantee you that children are drawn to those uh, that are smile and laugh more because that identifies them uh, with those people. Now, in the first century, children didn't have a lot of rights. They were to be seen and not heard. We see this in Luke chapter 18 when some parents were trying to bring their infant children to Jesus and the disciples are like, get out of here. Jesus got more important things to do than to deal with your rug rats. That's what the disciples essentially told them. And Jesus said in verse 16, suffer little children to come unto me. He says, don't you dare stop them. Forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. In both Matthew and Mark, children came to Jesus and he received them. He had a soft spot for them. He was passionate about protecting them from harm. This is just a social observation again. But because of what we know about human behavior, this leads us to conclude that Jesus smiled much. Jesus had a happy demeanor and he had a pleasant Uh, He had a pleasant attitude throughout life. The fact that children flock to him is telling. Children are drawn to happy adults, not unhappy ones. Now, second point I want to make, in his own words. The Bible contains many indications of Jesus' joy and happiness. And this is, again, using some common sense. It takes a joyful person to instruct his disciples in the act of joy. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, It takes, uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And the very next verse connects his disciples' joy with Jesus' joy when he said, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. We read in our text, (coughs) verse Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. 
The word translated joy here is, is karai. It means joy, gladness, great happiness. Essentially, Jesus is saying, hey, you see my joy. You see the type of life that I have. I want my joy to be your joy. Now, if Jesus Christ was the man that we see reflected in the paintings, this wouldn't even make much sense. A gloomy person cannot say, I want my joy to be your joy with any effectiveness. You can see how happy I am. And bubbling over. I want this abundance of joy to be your joy. No thanks. You would think as you hear that. Only a person that demonstrated it could extend it to another. Jesus was joyful. What a great goal in life to be as happy as Jesus was. Jesus was a happy person. His happiness set him apart from the religious leaders in his day. The Pharisees were anything but happy. They were like clouds on a sunny day. I mean, you had a, your life could be going good, and here comes a Pharisee, and they would just ruin everything. Uh, you see, <clears throat> because happy people focus on what they have, unhappy people focus on what they're missing. And the Pharisees did not have the joy of God in their life, because the, and they were miserable because unhappy people, uh, they, they, they be realizing what they were missing, not understanding how they could receive it, made them miserable. And can I tell you something about unhappy people? Unhappy people resent happy people. You've been there before, if you're honest with yourself. You've been super grouchy. You just woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and you've been just sour all morning, and then somebody happily floats in front of you, you just want to knock them in the face. Just be honest. Nobody here but us. We, we, we feel it, because unhappy people resent happy people. And the Pharisees resented Jesus Christ. Some people are so broken, they get mad at you for being whole. And this was the Pharisees with their furrowed brows and their critical spirit and their nasty demeanor because they had these endless rules that, they, uh, that really ended up rejecting the joy that God intended them to have. Uh, because of the, the, their rules, I mean, God gave them feasts and celebrations and Sabbath days and all these things to celebrate, and they were turning them into a drudgery. But Jesus now... Jesus stood in stark contrast to these holy men of the day. His first miracle was at a wedding. A wedding. Do you think at this wedding, he sat in the corner like a fuddy-duddy, stick in the mud? I don't think so at all. Uh, he was part of the festivities. So much so that when they ran out of wine, he made more for the wedding. They were having a good time. Uh, by the way, I'll insert this. I do not believe for a minute that was alcoholic wine. Now, do you think that it's probable that the Lord Jesus Christ would create what the Bible calls a mocker, biting as a serpent, stinging like an adder, the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of asps? Do you suppose that Jesus would use his miraculous power to produce some 60 to 126 gallons of intoxicating wine? There's actually a considerable effort that, uh, evidence that Jesus uh, produced a high-quality, unfermented wine. The term wine in the Bible now uh, does refer both to unfermented and fermented. It basically just means fruit of the vine. So you could go to High V and go to the fruit aisle and buy Welch's wine today, okay? That's what it would be referring to, just grape juice. The, the wine or grape juice that Jesus made was of the highest quality. In fact, in John 2.10, it says it was good wine. Now, historical writings tell us that during biblical times, the best wine was non-alcoholic wine. Plutarch said this, wine is rendered feeble in strength when it is frequently filtered. The spirit thus being excluded, the wine neither infests nor infests the mind and passions and is much more pleasant to drink, end quote. Turning water into the unfermented juice of grapes would have been a much greater miracle at the time that Jesus did this. Because the Bible tells us in John 2.13, it was just before the Passover, this wedding was. This was just before the first grapes of the season would be harvested and made into fresh grape juice at the harvest. 
Now, I remind you, this might be a shock to some of us who are used to them, but in Bible times, they did not have refrigerators or freezers. And so the only wine that would be left over just before a harvest would be old wine, fermented wine. Otherwise, it would be spoiled. And so it would be all the greater miracle if Jesus would now create, as I believe he did, fresh, high-quality grape juice, which, and, which is what I believe made that uh, part, the uh, head of the party, the person that was there, his host, say, exclaim, wow, you've saved the best for last. I don't believe Jesus made alcoholic wine. Now, this is one of the greatest things about Bible Baptist Church. All that was free. We don't charge you extra when we divert from the message and give some extra examples, okay? So uh, let's put, the point I'm trying to make, though, is that Jesus knew how to enjoy his life. He knew how to be a blessing to those around him. Do you think he sat at that wedding with his arms folded in a corner with a scowl on his face? Not on your life. Have you seen a Jewish wedding? Or seen it maybe on television or videos or something? It is a joyful occasion. And Jesus was right there in the middle of it. So much so was Jesus a pleasant person with a pleasant demeanor that they said in Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, <coughs> the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. The idea here is that Jesus was a good guest to have at a dinner party. He was upbeat. The Pharisees were never in danger of being accused of gluttony or being a wine bibber because they never went to any parties. They weren't invited uh, they, unless they crashed a party or spent much time with regular people. I ask you, if you wanted to have a big giant get-together, maybe somebody's birthday and to celebrate, would you invite a Pharisee? Neither would I, nor would they. They weren't there. They weren't uh, a, a part of the people. Jesus was not serious enough for the Pharisees' taste, so they imagined he couldn't be holy. <clears throat> now, understand this. Jesus was both a man of sorrows and a man of joy. Isaiah 53, 3, we read earlier, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus was called a man of sorrows, specifically in relationship to his redemptive work. When he's going to the cross, he says in Mark 13, 34, 14, 34, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. But this was on the worst day of his life. He was facing a death worse than any human had ever faced. This is not indicative of his day-to-day -day temperament of who he was. Knowing the price that he paid for our sins, does being a man of sorrows contradict the joy of Jesus? I say absolutely not. Sorrow and happiness can and do coexist within the same person. We can have sadness in our life because of circumstances surrounding us. If we have a loved one pass away, or we're facing financial ruin, or something bad is happening in our life, all right, of course we're not going to be skipping around rejoicing about that. There can be sadness in our life. But here's the key, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus knew that the basis for our sorrow is temporary, but the basis for our joy is eternal. And that's the key to Jesus' type of joy. William Morris writes this, the very fact that Jesus did attract hurting people to himself shows <coughs> that he cannot have been forbidding in his manner. It suggests that the man of sorrow's conception of his personality has been overrated in the past. Had he been a gloomy individual, and a killjoy, he would not have had such an appeal to common people and children, end quote. Listen, dear friend, if we picture Jesus walking around in constant sadness or anger, if we see Jesus grumbling and constantly looking to condemn people, uh, we have got the wrong picture of our Savior. We're not seeing the Jesus revealed in the Bible. In Luke chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus goes to the temple to speak and he unrolls the scroll and he begins to read out of Isaiah chapter 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised. That's a, that's a scripture, uh, prophetic scripture about the Messiah. And then he closed the scroll. He looks at, up at the people that are listening. And he says these words, Today is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And you want to talk about a riot that caused a riot. Because people got all upset that he would claim to be the Messiah. But I, I'm not focusing on that. I want to go back to Isaiah 61. Jesus didn't read this part here in the temple, but it continues with its prophecy about Jesus. This is what it says. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in my Lord. My soul shall be joyful to my God. For he hath clothed me in the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornament. And as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. He is talking about great joy here. Uh, using a wedding to accentuate a, this picture of happiness. This passage tells us that the Father is the Son's source of joy, just like Paul had talked about that we read a little bit earlier. The gospel that is not characterized by overwhelming gladness isn't the gospel. We see joy all in the life of Jesus. I want to see make another point. Jesus was an interesting preacher. I love preaching, obviously. Uh, I love to listen to preaching. Uh, I like to listen, I, I listen to many, I uh, have different podcasts, I listen to different ones that, uh, I <coughs> use, you know, it all started with tapes, you remember them things? Those things you rewound with pencils, remember those things? Uh, that I used, I started with that, and now we've moved all the way up to being able to listen online, but I love listening to preachers, I love to go to conferences and, and where the preaching is hot and strong, and, and, uh, but I tell you what I do not love, this is confession time. Boring preacher. Who's with me? Okay. Who says, I'm sitting in front of one right now. What are you talking about? All right. I don't like a passionless, monotone, dry, boring preacher. One man said, many preachers would make a good martyr. They're so dry they would burn well. I would never say that about any preacher. That's what somebody else said. But Oliver Wendell Holmes, that's cold, isn't it? Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., he was a member of the United States Supreme Court for 30 years. One time, Justice Holmes explained his career choice to someone in an interview, and he said, I almost entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Changed the whole man's trajectory of his life. A pastor was doing a children's church sermon he had all the kid children come forward and sit around the platform while he told a story to them and <clears throat> the adults were still out in the seats and, and he just did this for a few minutes uh, every Sunday uh, to try to connect with the kids. And this day he gave the story of Jonah and he talked about how Jonah disobeyed God and he got on a ship and he got thrown overboard, a, a, a fish swallowed him. And then he talked about how the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry ground. When the pastor was finished, he tried to solicit some input from the children to make sure they were listening. So he asked, hey, so boys and girls, what does the fish vomiting Jonah out on the dry land teach us today? One of the little boys got all excited, put his arm up. He says, I know, I know, pick me, pick me. He said, uh, what about you, little Johnny? He says, pastor, it proves that even a fish can't stomach a bad preacher. Amen? That's what that story teaches us. I agree. I like a preacher with some personality, with some passion. Abraham Lincoln said, when I see a man preach, I want it to look like he's fighting off a swarm of bees. I agree with him too. I like a preacher that has some passion. There's nothing worse than a man behind the pulpit that is drab and dull. A preacher ought to be able to connect with the people he is speaking to. Sometimes this includes a little humor. And Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever lived. Uh, for example, he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. He's been speaking for quite a while. If you've read your Bible in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, you'll see the, the Sermon on the Mount was quite a lengthy sermon. So he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and he gets to <coughs> chapter 7, and he's been talking for quite a while now. He's touched on a lot of subjects. Time has passed. One thing I have learned from standing behind a pulpit, that it does not matter the depth of the truth that you're dispelling. 
It doesn't mount, amount to a hill of beans if people are sleeping. Amen? Uh, it, doesn't, it, it needs to be caught. And so uh, Jesus had been at it for a while, and he wakes up his audience with a funny illustration. Now, you, uh, just to set it up, as Jesus is looking around to the religious situation of his day, he senses a big problem. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were as sitting in the place of the critic. They were quick to pass judgment on those who did not live up to their expectations. So Jesus tackles this problem of hypocrisy in judging others. Did Jesus use humor in his preaching? I'll let you be the judge. Listen to these verses in Matthew chapter 7, starting verse number 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in mine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, this is a hilarious, ridiculous picture. We've heard it so many times, maybe, and of course it's in Old English. We might have lost its humorous twist, but I would, gar- I would venture to say that the people in Jesus' audience that day had a great laugh from this picture. It's like a scene out of the Three Stooges. Here's a guy trying to pick a speck out of somebody's eye, and he's got a big two-by-four coming out of his eye. And so he's, as he turns and he's trying to do this, and every time he turns his head, people have to duck all about him. It was a very humorous picture. And Jesus using this illustration, uh, and it's obviously pointed at the Pharisees. And here are the Pharisees standing off to his side, looking all angry like they always did, because when they were a kid, they made that face and it stuck that way. And so they're always angry and always scowling. And here people are hearing this illustration, laughing, and then they look over at the Pharisees and probably laughed all the harder because they knew who Jesus was talking about. And uh, he's just skewering them with this illustration. And I wonder if people didn't get a good chuckle out of that. Another example, a glimpse of Jesus' sense of humor can be seen in a story about his disciples, James and John. In Luke chapter 9, they were snubbed by the, some Samaritans and uh, said, Samaritans, basically, we aren't interested. Uh, on Tuesday night, we were out uh, passing out flyers for VBS, and, and uh, Brother Larry was with me and his wife, and we were uh, visited with some people, talked to some folks, and, of course, nobody was rude to us or and sent us away, but sometimes people do. Sometimes, oh, not interested. Well, that's what happened to James and John that day. And Jesus, they came to this village, and the Samaritans, nope, not interested, move along. So James and John get to to the edge of the village, and they stop and say, hey, Jesus, let's call down fire from heaven. Think about it. All the people did is just say, we're not interested. Let's burn them up. Let's call fire down from heaven. Of course, Jesus rebuked them as he should have, but I often wonder if he didn't get a little bit of a chuckle from their zeal. In Mark chapter 3, verse 17, they're sitting around and Jesus says, I'm going to call you guys, I'm going to call you the sons of thunder. That's what Jesus called them. Gave them a nickname. Now, again, we read these things, we don't really put ourselves in the picture. But think about the way the other disciples around them would have responded when Jesus said that. Spewing out their Diet Coke, laughing themselves silly. Sons of thunder? These guys wanted to call down thunder and lightning from heaven, and Jesus calls them the sons of thunder. you got to remember, this is a group of 12 guys, and when guys get together, they razz each other all the time. That's what the disciples would have been doing. And here, Jesus got involved here just a little bit, calling them the sons of thunder. I can imagine uh, as they would be sitting around and the James and John would show up, oh, everybody rise, here come the thunder boys, and they just razzing each other. And Jesus... Got involved just a little bit with that. I think he had a great sense of humor. Look, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious or disrespectful to our Savior in the least. Believe me, know my heart. But I truly believe that we have been misrepresenting him for a long time. Jesus had joy. He was a pleasure to be around. He was a delight to hear. People came from miles around just to do so. And duds don't don't draw droves. Blah, say that. Duds don't draw droves, and Jesus did. But I I do want to conclude today with the primary source of his joy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. 
The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We see there his person. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, he, above all others, has run his race in life. He was obedient to the Father. And can I remind you that joy is a byproduct of obedience. Your joy will depend directly on how obedient you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 1 verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We see his passion, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. No runner in any race of life had ever had such terrible experiences of Christ, yet he kept looking ahead. He kept pressing on with his heart fixed on his coming joy. His joy was in his mission. His joy was in his purpose. Your joy will be in your mission. It'll be in your purpose. Uh, his joy was wrapped up in what God wanted him to do. We see his position now. Uh, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There he is, crowned as he should be. There he is, smiling down from his throne on those who are now following his lead. And can I tell you, his position ought to give us a reason for our joy. He's sitting on the throne, amen? Hey, when life gets out of control, when things happen to you that you can't control, can you just have some joy in the fact that there's a God on the throne still that uh, is in uh, ruling all of this. Friend, we too can live a life of joy. We can rise above our circumstances when we comprehend what Jesus understood. The basis of our sorrow is temporary. The basis of our joy is eternal. Joylessness is a sin. Let's not be guilty of joylessness. God's word commands us to rejoice. If we truly believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he made us right before God, that he has ascended to rule on the right hand of the Father, then there is nothing that can steal our joy. We can rejoice in all things, good and bad, when we have eternity in view. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am, redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that in the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, friend, you can't rejoice in that. You can't rejoice in eternity in heaven. You can't rejoice that heaven is your own. But guess what? You can before you leave today, amen? Because the Bible is very clear that he gave himself so that you could receive that gift of salvation when you realize your need and your inability to do it on your own. For the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And that is all we earn is our death, really. We earn our death through our sin. But then he goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In one verse, he switches modes there. He goes from a wage to something we earn, and then he goes to a gift which is a reflective of something we cannot earn. And because we cannot earn it, he gives it freely. Hallelujah. That's something to rejoice in. If you're a Christian today, but you have not been living a life of rejoicing, repent of that, because joylessness, joylessness is a sin. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which path us all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The joy of Jesus can be your joy today. You know, really, the Secret of happiness is to find your joy in another's joy. And your joy can be found in Christ. Jesus was joyful. We can be too. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed.